Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Please turn to, in your King James Bibles for English speaking people, please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. That's where we're going to start for this study. And God put it on my heart, and I named this study in Pride Instructing Those That Impose Themselves? Question mark. Hmm. Is that how we're supposed to do things? Is that what the Bible says? Now, I use the word pride, but you can use a lot of words. And I'm seeing this in the body of Christ in the comment section under, uh, under videos and whatnot that some of the brethren are doing. And it just really pricked my heart. But in pride, instructing those that oppose themselves. Uh, in, uh, let's say, bitterness, instructing those that oppose themselves. In envy, in envy, instructing those that oppose themselves. Well, in name-calling, see, it's okay, we can call names. In name-calling, instructing those that oppose themselves? Well, no, well, mocking. In mocking, instructing those that oppose themselves, I could keep going. In anger, how's that one? Because people, I hear this in the comment section so much. It's righteous anger, it's righteous anger, that makes it okay. In in anger, instructing those that oppose themselves? And we'll get into this, being angry with the cause. Is it okay to be angry with the cause? Absolutely. But when you go to instruct somebody with truth to get them on the right path, someone who's opposing themselves, is it okay to use anger? Let's see what the Bible has to say. We can go off of what man says, or we can go off of what the Word of God says. 2 Timothy 2.24 and the servant of the Lord must not strive. Okay. Uh, what's going on, what, what pricked my heart is what I'm seeing going on in some, uh, some people's ministries. It's becoming a drama fest. Okay. It's just a lot of people who love debating. They love name calling. They love mocking. Um, it's just becoming a drama fest that's, that's built on striving. Okay. I preach the truth to people. Take it or leave it. Then I go on to somebody else who does want it. I'm preaching to the brethren who want the truth, who love the truth. You don't want the truth? Okay. I'm not going to strive with you. I'm not. This is not going to be a drama fest uh, ministry that the Lord has blessed me with on YouTube. It's not going to be a drama fest. You don't want it? You don't want it. I'm going to continue preaching the truth. But there's a lot of brethren out there in ministry that are starting to get to the point where they, they're getting into striving. They're getting into the drama fest. Be careful. Be careful. The name calling, the mocking, the anger, the bitterness, the envy. It's all there. Okay? Be careful. But remember, I'm going to read this as, as it's English. So it says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. So a servant of the Lord must be gentle unto all men. Not just Christians are professing Christians. Okay? Not, in other words, not just brothers and sisters in Christ, body of Christ, saints, church, church of the living God, whatever title you use or description you use, whether they are part of the body of Christ or they're just professing Christians. Okay? Lost world. It says gentle unto all men. If you want to be a good servant of Jesus Christ, you need to learn to be gentle unto all men. There's some brethren that used to be like that when they first started ministry. But now they seem to have lost that. They're not gentle unto all men. Okay. Uh, and the servant of the Lord, those who want to serve the Lord, Jesus Christ. Remember 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says there's but one Catholic Lord, Jesus Christ. And the servant of the Lord must not, not strive, I'm sorry, but the servant of the Lord must be apt to teach. The Bible talks about be ready to give an answer. When someone, if someone has a question, be ready to give an answer. We're supposed to take God's word, 2 Timothy 2.15, and study it. And we're supposed to hide God's word in our heart, not only to live it, but also to give an answer. When someone else has a question, okay. To be apt to teach. If you want to be a good servant of the Lord, make sure you have a teaching atmosphere. 
I've always said this, brother says Christ, if you want to call out a wolf in sheep's clothing online, if you want to call out Robert Breaker as a false convert, if you want to call out uh, Steve Anderson as a false convert, if he's still out there, if you want to call out um, Edward P.F., King's Table, uh, Gene Kim, uh, whoever else, because there's all these names out there that are false, you do it in a teaching atmosphere. You turn it into a Bible study. You don't have a ranting and raving video. You have a Bible study video. Apt to teach. That's always what I try to tell the brethren. I love it. Okay. Um, what was it? Uh, Brother Brian, when it was King James Video Ministries, and he had the attitude that Jesus could come back any day now, and he li believed it, he lived it, okay? He did a series of videos go, uh, responding to Steve Anderson. If you don't know who Steve Anderson is, he was a guy that was into replacement theology, and he's post-trib. has a false gospel. He has a King James Bible, but he doesn't believe in it. He uses it to make money and to, be, and to start an occult, a club. Okay? But he made all these videos about post-trib moments, post-trib moments. Now, Brian, at that time, in his right head, looking for the coming of Jesus Christ, the imminent return of Jesus Christ, he made videos responding to each one of his post-trib moments with pre-trib moments and answered the lies that he was teaching, but he did it through a Bible study. And I love that. We got to follow along in the scriptures, and we learned about the Word of God, and we made, he made sure that we were, he was instructing us and trying, trying so hard to instruct those that were following a wolf in sheep's clothing. Okay? He turned it into a Bible study so those of us that were still staying the course to absolute truth could learn something, and he could try to teach some of the people that were going astray, and he did. There's a lot of people that came out of that occult and that false teaching online. And he did. But he turned it into a Bible study. Not a rant and a rave, name calling like it is today. Okay? But apt to teach. You turn it into a Bible study. If you want to be a good servant of the Lord, you teach. And if someone doesn't want it, he doesn't want it. And that's where this next one comes in. 2 Timothy 2.24 it says, And the servant of the Lord must be patient. Okay, there it is, patient. You want to be a good servant of the Lord? you got to learn patience. When you teach something, it might take a while. i got some testimonies when we get down as we get through the study. It might take a while for it to really sink into some people. You've got to learn to have patience. All right. I preached to some people, and they called me off, told me off, and got mad, disappeared. A few months later, they come back. I'm sorry, you were right. I planted seeds. Someone else must have come along and watered. And they came to the knowledge of the truth, and they came back later. I didn't go off on them. I didn't call them names. I didn't mock them. I preached truth to them. They didn't want it. I moved on. And later on, they came back. You were right, brother. What you said, you were right. I'm sorry for going off on you. you got to have patience and let God deal with them. Right? One thing I, where I left out is, in, is, is, did the Bible say in vengeance instructing those that oppose themselves, okay? No, in meekness. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I'll repay. God will deal with them, saved and lost. God will deal with them, okay? But you've got to have patience, brothers and sisters of Christ. And that's one thing I pray for, and I asked you in my prayer request, I really need patience. There's, uh, there's some people that you really need a lot of patience with them. Right? Or you could wind up screwing things up with your words, losing your temper. Like I said, backbiting and whispering. You need to have patience. God will deal with them. If they're truly saved, God will bring them around. Right? 25. Here's the key verse for this study. In meekness, because I already said it, meekness. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. So a servant of the Lord must have meekness when he's instructing those that oppose themselves. If you want to be a good servant of the Lord, an effective servant of the Lord, you instruct those that oppose themselves and you do it in meekness. Not pride, not ego, not envy, 
not bitterness, you know, not with name calling, not with mocking. Okay? You do it in meekness. If God prevention will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth that, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Now here's the thing we just read there. The snare of the devil, taken captive by his will. I believe, when it says all men, it's talking about all men. Saved and lost. Why do I believe that? Go back to 2 Timothy 2.16. Go back to 2.16. He's talking about, Paul's talking about, here's professing Christians, and he realizes that some of them are, are false converts. They're lost, and some are real. Let's listen to what he has to say about this. But shun and profane vain babbling. Okay. You know what becomes vain babbling more than anything? When you're debating, an, an, a discussion turns into an argument, then turns into a debate. It becomes vain babbling. If that person wanted the truth, it should have stayed at a discussion, and the person who's lined up with the scriptures gets the person who wants the truth to line up with the scriptures. Okay? But when you start getting drawn into an argument that starts turning into a debate, it's just vain babbling. But shun profane and vain babbling. For they will increase into more ungodliness. They do. Okay? You know what debates do? They uh, put doubt in people's minds. The person who's debating for the wrong side puts doubt in people's minds. Okay? He causes people to fall away. And Paul gives a great example of this. Let's keep reading. And their word will eat as doth a canker. When you let debates happen, when you get into arguments where it becomes an argument and it turns into a debate, their words, people are they're on the wrong side. Their words will eat as doth a canker, of whom is um, Hymenus and Philetus. Who, this is their this, this is their profane and vain babbling, who concerning the truth have erred. They knew the truth and turned from it. They once stood for it and turned from it. Saying that the resurrection is past already. Right? There's some people out there who believe that the resurrection already happened. It hasn't yet. The catching away of the body of Christ has not happened yet. There's people who don't believe it will happen before the time of Jacob's trouble. There's some people who profess that they believe in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away of the body of Christ, but with the life they're living, they deny it. You know how that happens? They turn their back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ. They're not looking for that blessed hope anymore. Okay? But you have these people, they're preaching that the resurrection is past. It already happened. And they're deceiving people. Look at this. It says, and overthrowing the faith of some. Okay? Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. You're always going to have people out there preaching lies and deception. You're always going to have wolves in sheep's clothing on YouTube. They're going to be out there trying to preach lies and deception. They're always going to be out there. But because they're out there doesn't mean that all of a sudden we're, we, we've lost the battle and, and everything's just horrible. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. If someone has the Holy Spirit in them and they're and they're taking this book, the King James Bible, God's perfect written word for English-speaking people, and they're taking God's word, and they're doing 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is possible for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, perfect, perfect heart with the Lord, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If he's doing that, if he starts out following someone who's false, God's going to get him back on the right foundation. This. Not that man. If he's on the right foundation and he comes across somebody who's false, after a little bit, God's going to show him that person's false. This is the true foundation. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Notice how it said they overthrew the faith of some. They got some to turn their back on the faith. Free time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ, the resurrection. They got them to turn their back on it. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. We instruct those in meekness that impose themselves. But we do it in meekness. 
to try to win people to the truth. And if we don't win them to the truth, God will deal with them. Okay? We have people professing to be saved. Nevertheless, the foundation of God sure have the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. That's the seal he's talking about. Having this seal. Remember what the Bible says? Sealed into the day of redemption. See how it kind of lines up? They're fighting the resurrection. And the Bible talks about having this seal. I'm sealed into the day of redemption. That's when the resurrection is going to happen. He has this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. At the catching away of the body of Christ, we're going to find out who was truly saved beyond a shadow of a doubt and who was truly lost. Period. Time for wondering, doubting, all the lost world arguing and debating and all the things we talked about, pride, ego, bitterness towards people, whether they're saved or not. That's all going to get answered at the catch away of the body of Christ, which can happen any day now. I have to keep saying that, brothers of Christ, any day now. Are you living for the Lord? Sanctification, ministry of reconciliation, ambassador for Jesus Christ, hiding this book Hiding God's Word in your heart and living it. Okay? He can come back any day now. Get those sins on, under the cross. Get those sins that forgiven. Get those uh, addictions out of your life. Get that covetousness out of your life. Jesus Christ could come back any day now. We're so close, brothers of Christ. With everything that's going on out there, we are so close. God, Jesus Christ can come back any day now. Amen. But the Lord knoweth them that are His. What we're supposed to do is just keep preaching the truth. We're not supposed to be sitting here debating hardcore with people whether this person's saved, that person's saved. I'll, I'll call people out as wolves in sheep's clothing. Robert Breaker, wolf in sheep's clothing. Okay, Gene Kim, wolf in sheep's clothing. Edward P.F., wolf in sheep's clothing. Okay, and some of those other people, uh, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. False gospels, met, messed up doctrines, they're not Bible believers, and it's been proven. I'm not saying you can't do that, but I'm not going to sit here and debate whether everyone that follows him is saved or lost. I'm not going to sit here and debate. You can be deceived and God will show you the truth. Like I said, people were deceived by Steve Anderson. And through a brother in Christ, God brought them out of that false foundation to the true foundation. They were saved. Because once the truth came across to them and they were shown the truth, and this guy is a false and a fake, they came out of it. All right? We're not to sit here and debate too hardcore on who's saved and who's lost. The Lord knoweth them that are His. Are they standing for absolute truth? What's their attitude towards absolute truth? There are going to be signs of false converts out there, absolutely. When in doubt, give them the gospel. Saved or lost, when in doubt, give them the gospel. God knoweth, the Lord knoweth them that are His. That's our attitude, I just give them the gospel. Well, what if they were truly saved? Maybe it'll remember, remind them of why they got saved and who it is they, that saved them and who it is they're supposed to be serving. Remember, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. Some brethren start straying and getting lost in the world and worldliness and thinking they're their own all of a sudden. Okay. The Lord knoweth them that are His. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Brothers and sisters of Christ. Yes, the changed life. New creature in Christ Jesus. Oh, that's not important. Let every one that, name, that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's how you know a lot of these false converts out there that claim the title. If you didn't watch that study on uh, Words to No Prophet where we went over the word Christian, it's something that you are called. It's not something you claim for yourself. It's something that someone looks at you. You line up with this book. You're living a life of Christ. You're following Jesus Christ. Jesus said, the man loved me, he will keep my words. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. They like the lost world likes to claim the title Christian for themselves. Christ, Jesus Christ. You're a Christian, you're following Jesus Christ. Okay? Let everyone that nameth the name Christ depart from iniquity. A lot of these Babel buildings and a lot of these people in these Babel buildings, you look at them and it's like, what's their attitude towards sin? What the Bible calls sin. Not worldly morality, but what the Bible says is sin. Those, those names that I mentioned off as being wolves in sheep's clothing, 
They don't like to depart from sin. They like to be, you can be as gods knowing good and evil. They get to decide what's sin and what's not sin. They don't line up with the scriptures. Depart from iniquity. Verse 20, but in a great house, this is something some of us forget, brothers and sisters in Christ, even me. This study is for me as much as it is for you, brothers in Christ. I need this just as much as you do. We forget this sometimes. Verse 20. But in a great house, talking about the house of the Lord. Remember what the Bible says? The house of the Lord, which is the church of the living God. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, people that are uh, just love the word of God, they're living it, they're hiding all the doctrines, instruction righteousness, getting out there, being part of the ministry of reconciliation, being an ambassador, remember what we said? Uh, when you preach the gospel, you can preach the gospel, or you can live the gospel. In other words, you can be a witness verbally, leading people to Christ, or the life that you're living can be a light to them to lead them to Christ. Okay? But you have people that are gold and silver, but also of wood and earth. Okay? And some to honor, and some to dishonor. Remember the wood and earth. When you go before the judgment seat of Christ, what gets burnt up? The wood. Okay? The silver and the gold pass through the fire. Okay? But the wood, hay, and stubble gets burnt up. Hmm. Some to honor, and some to dishonor. And he gave an example of two men that dishonored were dishonorable. They turned their back on the resurrection. The pre-time of Jacob's trouble cast away the body of Christ, and they were overthrowing the faith of some. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Okay? So when we read 2 Timothy 2.24, where it says, go back down, it says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, whether they profess to be saved or not, that's how we're supposed to treat the world. Because you're going to have a lot of people professing to be saved that are not saved. And if you don't follow this, what happens? If God prevents will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, you put a wall where they're not going to repent. If it's always adversarial, and you're basing it, you're instructing them in pride, and anger, and bitterness, and envy, name-calling, backbiting, whispering, uh, mocking, it becomes adversarial. You're not supposed to, I'm not your enemy, brother says Christ. That's supposed to be our attitude. I'm not your enemy. I'm your friend. I'm here to tell you the truth. Remember, friend's just the opposite of enemy. It doesn't mean we're best pals and I'm fellowshipping with the lost world. It simply means I'm your friend. means I'm not your enemy. I'm here to present truth to you. I'm pleading you with my heart and meekness. You can have authority, like I'm preaching right now, authority, but you can do it with meekness. Okay. I'm your friend. But when it becomes adversarial, how can God give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth? Because then they won't want the truth. You just put a wall up and it's become adversarial. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive at his will. Same thing with brothers and sisters in Christ. What does this mean to be taken captive of him at his will? Turn to 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. 1 through 13. We're going to read 1 through 13 just so you can understand what's going on here. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Who's the you? The body of Christ. Professing Christians. And such fornication is not such as, as it is not so much as named among the Gentiles. In other words, they're, they're getting so messed up and so fleshly, he's hearing this bad report, it's, it's worse than the lost world. It's not, know how we used to say that there's some people that you're starting to act like, those brethren, we're talking to brothers and sisters of Christ, you're starting to act like the lost world. You're starting to look like the lost world. You're starting to talk like the lost world. You better get your heart right with the Lord. You're trying to resurrect that old man. Make sure that old man stays dead and buried at the cross. That love you have for the Lord. There's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. 
you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. The old man is dead and buried at the cross with Jesus Christ. The new man is raised with Jesus Christ. Okay? We used to say that, that, hey, you're starting to look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world. Be careful, brother. Be careful, sister. Well, he, Paul's saying, it's worse. You're worse than the lost world. I know lost people that are living better than you. Okay? That no one should have his father's wife. The fornication was so bad. Now, I still believe that it's a, it's a mother-in-law. When you say father, when you look in the Bible, be careful. When you look in the Bible in the Old Testament, when it said father's wife, it's because it was a, it was a mother-in-law. Or it would say the person's mom. Or it would say the father's wife when it wasn't the person's mom. So I, like I said, be careful with that one. But it's still bad. Okay? And ye are puffed up. And pride instructing those that impose themselves. Pride is never good, brothers and sisters of Christ. The Bible says pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And I got some people that were very prideful attacking me on that when I did a study on that and said, listen, it says pride before destruction. Not a fall, because you'll read all these little signs that they do and they had t-shirts, pride before a fall, pride before a fall. No, it's a haughty spirit before a fall. When the Holy Spirit turns to full-on pride, it will destroy you. I can trip and fall and get back up. But if my legs are crushed underneath me and destroyed, I ain't getting back up. Pride goeth before destruction. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned. Humbled yourself. Meekness. And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Remember, meekness. That he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Absolutely. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath done this deed. Notice Paul, in his writing, he's correcting the person who done this deed. Put him out until he repents and gets his heart right with the Lord. Put him out of the church. Put him out of the fellowship. Put him out of the church. Treat him like he's lost as we keep going here. But notice where he's not doing. He's not losing his temper. Okay? He's not speaking in pride. It's not an ego that he's speaking from or bitterness. He's not name calling. He's not mocking. And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. For I barely as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath done this deed. It's a comma. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my, in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. Once again, you see that there's love behind it. When you put someone out of your fellowship, you're correcting someone, and you put them out of your fellowship, you're doing it out of love, not anger. Not bitterness, not resentment, not vengeance. Why? You want to see that person get their heart right with the Lord. And sometimes you've got to put people out of your fellowship to really wake them up and let God bring them to the knees. Remember those that are without God judgeth? Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unclean. The Bible talks about not only that do them, talking about sin, but take pleasure in them that do them. Your glory is not good. You have someone come around bragging about his sin, and then you have someone else going on, Ha oh, ha, oh, I want to listen to it. Yes, that was great. Ha, oh, you're a good man. Good. High five, high five. I didn't do the sin, that person did. But this Bible says I'm equally guilty as that person. Why? Because I'm glorying in his sin. But take pleasure in them that do them. You're equally guilty. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. When you have people that try to, res brethren, if they're truly saved, try to resurrect the old man, they're bringing in leaven. Put them out. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. When you get saved, the changed life, God starts purging your life, sanctification, and gets all that junk out of your life. The old man is dead and buried. And Paul warns about people, brethren, trying to resurrect the old man. Okay. 
that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover sacrificed for us. New man, old man dead and buried with Christ, a new man is raised with Christ. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Where would you see pride in there? Sincerity and truth. Sincerity. You just speak truth and you be honest about it. Sometimes people can be what they call brutally honest. No, you, some people just don't like the truth. They don't like honesty. Okay? There's some people who can speak truth and they do it with anger and bitterness and, and it just turns people off to the truth. You speak with sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an ep epistle not to, to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous. There's some brethren that get, that get into covetousness and the Bible talks about how covetousness, which is idolatry. There's items in their life that become idols because of their covetousness. Or extortioners. People that are in it for the money. Or with idolaters, just straight out idolaters. Okay? People like to take the King James Bible and the true uh, faith and turn it into an organized religion. And they start adding all these idols and everything. Be careful. For then must she needs go out of the world. Remember, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company with, if any man that is, that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetousness, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one, no, not eat. For what have I to do to, the, to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourself this wicked person. Look at this correction. Paul's doing it in meekness. There's no exclamation points. He's not yelling. He's not happy about it. I'm not saying he's just all happy and love. No, he's stern. This is wrong. He has authority and he's serious. Sincerity and truth. He's serious. But where's the name calling? Where's the name calling? Where's the mocking? Backbiting and whispering. The, 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 the trying to correct them in anger and um, uh, bitterness and envy. Okay. Where is all that? It's not there. Sincerity and truth. But the point of that verse that we read there was for uh, 1 Corinthians 5.5 5, where it says, To deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. And we go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 26. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him as will. You put them without, hoping that God will bring them to their knees and humble them. And get them to repent. And get that wickedness out of their life so they can come back in. Remember I told you, when you go to correct somebody, brother says Christ, your heart, the heart of a Christian, is to build them back up. Uh, Corinthians, we said that... I kept reading, but, um, oh, that's right, we turned the page. Uh, our job is to build people back up, right? right? Verse 5, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5, what we just read, there says, To deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. When you go to correct somebody, brother and sister Christ, it's not to destroy them. There's some people in pride, they try to correct people, and their heartfelt desire is to destroy them. Be careful. When you correct a brother or sister in Christ, when you're trying to call out a wolf in sheep's clothing, you don't, you're, that person doesn't want to listen. And you're trying to reach the people that are being deceived by this wolf in sheep's clothing, that's your target audience, the people that are being deceived. You're trying to... Correct them in order to build them back up. Break them down with truth in order to build them back up. Get them back on the right path. If they've, if they've strayed from the right path, or if they've never been on the right path, to get them saved and get them back, get them on the right path. To build you up. That's the whole point. Okay. 
Sometimes you have to remind saved sinners of who it is that saved them. Putting them out. Preach the gospel to them and put them out. By treating them also as if they were lost. Preach the gospel to them. But it's just Christ, I link the gospel message a lot. I talk to people online and when it starts realizing that they're against this book, they don't truly believe in this book, and they didn't get saved by the true plan of salvation that's found in this book, the King James Bible, God's perfect written word, the Holy Scriptures, I link the gospel message to them and I move on. I don't stay around and fight and argue. And some of them, they get really mad, but there's Christ. I link the gospel message and sometimes they'll come back with two, three, four, five responses trying to egg me into an argument and into a debate. They'll say, no, you're lost. No, you're a heretic. No, you're this. You're that. And they're trying to get me to respond because they, they keep making comments after comments and I'm ignoring them. I link the gospel message. I'm done. I'm moving on. Okay. You really want to upset people? You don't have to call them names. I'm talking about the lost world. You really want to upset false converts? You really want to upset the lost world? You don't have to call them names to upset them. You don't have to mock them to upset them. You really want to upset them? Preach the true plan of salvation to them. And boy, will you see them lose it. Well, I'm saved. I know what you're talking about. I'm saved. If somebody was to link me the true plan of salvation that was in the King James Bible, repentance towards God, repentance is having sorrow for your personal sins, and you take those that, that, that sorrow and that sin, and you throw it at the foot of the cross, your iniquities at the foot of the cross, and you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you, and afterwards there's a changed life. If someone was to send me the true plan of salvation, the changed life gospel, I would say amen. Amen. Yep, that's the gospel, King James Bible. That's the Jesus Christ that saved me. Saved a wretched, wretched man like me. I would not be getting so bent out of shape, getting angry and bitter and, and exploding. But they do. They do. Right? So, in, uh, so it says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. I want to go over some examples of people in the Bible that in meekness, they instructed those that opposed themselves. And you know what? What greater example can we use than Jesus Christ? Let's go talk about Jesus Christ. Turn to Matthew 5.22. we got to get one thing out of the way before we really get into it. Turn to Matthew 5.22. Remember what Paul said, Be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. Okay. What did Peter write? Be ye holy for I. It says, For it is written, Be ye holy for I am holy. Mm -hmm. Jesus oftentimes set the example. Now remember, Jesus is God Almighty. Manifest in the flesh. God has the authority to name call. God has the authority to mock. But Jesus in his earthly ministry... What I call what we call earthly ministry, but and when he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, virgin birth, death on the cross. I put this challenge out there, and no one's been able to, to do it because I use the Bible to define the Bible. I know it's kind of, um, I know that's uh, new for some people, but it was new for me when I got saved. I didn't know how to do that, so we instruct you with meekness. The Bible will, will uh, explain itself. Um, Elijah in the Old Testament. I used that for him and the priests of Baal. He mocks the priests of Baal. I said, that is what the Bible defines as mocking. And I said, show me where Jesus in his earthly ministry, when he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, God manifests in the flesh, show me where he's mocking anybody. Show me. I'm, I'm up for correction. Show me. No one's done it because people will say, see here, see here, he's mocking him with this parable. No, he's teaching him with this parable. He's not mocking. That's not the Bible definition of mocking. That's your definition of mocking. Okay? You can't get any more clear than what Elijah did to the priest of Baal. You know? Perhaps your God, your, your gods are in a long journey. Perhaps they sleepeth. Speak louder. And he's, he's mocking them. You can't get any more clear than that. Right. Matthew 5.22 
But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother, without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Now, that's not for today as far as being in danger of hellfire. Okay? You can call a brother or sister in Christ a fool and ask them for forgiveness and ask God for forgiveness. Today, he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the point we're grabbing for this study here is that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause. The Bible perversions like to take out without a cause. Why? Because you turn... Um, Turn to Matthew chapter 21, verse 12. We're going to read a story where Jesus got angry with the cause. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with being angry, brother, sister, Christ, but call. I'm angry with, God is angry with the wicked every day. I'm angry that these wolf and sheep's clothing are deceiving people. I am angry. Okay, and I'm angry with the cause. But if I'm going to reach the people he's deceiving, I cannot respond to them the wrong way. I have to instruct them in meekness and with sincerity and truth. Absolutely, you got to do it with truth. If you don't have the truth, you're lost. Right? It's that simple. Uh, John, don't turn here, but make sure you're in Matthew 21, 12. But John 7, 23, this is Jesus. He's being accused. These Pharisees are mad at him. And he says, If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry at me? Because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? They were angry with Jesus Christ without a cause. They're the ones that were guilty, not Jesus Christ. But Jesus said, without a cause. You can't be angry at a brother or sister in Christ if they've done wrong. Okay? I just don't like to be angry forever. I, I give that anger to the Lord and I give that brother or sister in Christ to the Lord. And say, Lord, I put them without. You deal with them. Okay, if I'm ever that angry, it's because they did something seriously wrong, turned their back on absolute truth, stabbed brethren in the back. The Bible says, um, if you sin against the brethren, you sinned against Christ. Okay, when you wrong a brother in Christ, you sin against Christ. You can be angry with the cause. But they were angry, the religious leaders were angry without a cause. But look how Jesus responded in meekness. They were angry at him without a cause, but he didn't yell at him and says, You're in danger of hellfire, you fool. You know, you um you know you're pathetic, man, you're pathetic, and you're going to hell, you're pathetic, and you're going to hell. How did Jesus respond? If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry? He's instructing those that oppose themselves. He's doing it in meekness. Because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? When you turn to Matthew 21, 12, this is where Paul, Jesus gets angry. With a cause. With a cause. And it's not much different than the Babel buildings of today. And some online ministries, a lot of online, online ministries, not just some, but a lot of online ministries. It's become money oriented. It's no longer about the Word of God, it's about income. Matthew 21, 12. We see that with a lot of people online. They are money-driven. Okay? Like I said, they take the word, this book, they take the true faith, and they try to turn it into an organized religion. And oftentimes when they do that, it they, what they're really doing is turning it into a business. A money-making business. Matthew 21, 12 says, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. With a cause. He was angry at those people with a cause. And said unto them, You guys are going to hell. You're pathetic. Name calling. No, no. What did he say? And he said unto them, It is written... My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it the den of thieves. Period. He's telling them with authority. Okay. He threw the tables over. He's angry with the cause. But when it came to instructing them for why he was doing what he was doing, he wasn't motivated by anger. 
Now, now does Jesus yell at everyone else there he is trying to reach? We're going to keep going. Does he yell at everyone else he's trying to reach for truth and chase them out with whips? We're going to find out in John 2.15. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them out with, of the temple. So he drove them out with the, the, the cords. As we're, going to, we're going to read each time the Bible talks about this situation. We're going to learn a little bit more. We're going to learn a little bit more. Okay, he chased them out. <coughs> and then he turned to the people that were still there and he started teaching them. Why that was wrong, and he started teaching him the words of his life. He started teaching them, and meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Matthew 21, 14 says, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Did he stay angry forever? No. Some people take that anger, and they hold it in their heart, and that anger turns into bitterness. That's not good, brother and sister Christ. Okay. Now, did Jesus yell at everyone else there is trying to reach to re he's trying to reach for the truth and chase them out with whips? No, he healed people. Then he taught them. Remember who you're talking to, your target audience. Matthew 21, 15, let's keep going. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful thing that he did, wonderful thing he did. And the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were sore displeased and said unto him, Hearest thou what these, these say? How did Jesus respond to these people? I mean, these people hate Jesus. They hate the prophecies in the Old Testament. They're all about profit. They're all about the flesh. They're all about worldliness. Okay. Chief priests and scribes. Now, did Jesus mock them? Call them names? Use sarcasm. Lose his temper, etc. How dare you speak to me in that way? I'm God manifest in the flesh. I threw in there, bow to me. Was he just... Or did he keep his calm? Let's keep reading. Matthew 21, 16. And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have ye not read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected phrase? And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Uh, you guys do error not understanding what's going on. You guys can't see who I am. Brother says, Christ, who are you talking to? He chased out those people that were buying and selling, that their hearts were probably hardened, they wouldn't listen. He chased them out. Then he talked to people that he was trying to reach. Who are you talking to, brothers in Christ in ministry? When you start going off and you're calling out a wolf in sheep's clothing, are you talking to that person? Or are you trying to reach the people they've deceived? Trying to reach the people they deceived. The people that sold and bought, he chased out. But not the people. The people were taken in by it. Okay? Remember who you're talking to. The people were taken in by what they were doing, so he chased out the people that was the root cause, and he went to the people and started preaching truth to them. Okay? Robert Breaker is the root cause. I've already tried preaching truth to him. I've talked to him in the comment section. I've tried talking to him about the gospel. He really hates the true plan of salvation in the King James Bible. I'm not trying to reach Robert Breaker anymore. I just warn people about him. And I'm trying to reach those that have been deceived by him. And you can't reach people with sarcasm, mocking, name-calling, bitterness, pride. All you're going to do is get them to cling to that false teacher, Robert Breaker, even more. That's all you're doing. Okay, Who are you talking to? Jesus went back to talk to the people that matter. And how he talked to them is important. Okay. Are you talking? I already talked about that. Remember, if you're calling out a wolf in sheep's clothing, make sure that you're not, you're angry with that person with the cause, but make sure that anger is not being deflected from that person to the people you're talking to. Okay? You might be angry with the cause, but be careful who that, where that anger is going. And doesn't start going on people that, there's people that have been deceived by him. People get deceived, brothers and sisters in Christ. I have been deceived. I'm not above being deceived. 
but I know how to keep from being deceived. You take this word and you hide it in your heart and you don't let go. You don't let go. Turn to Mark 11.15. Let's look at the second telling. This is how we get more information. And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessels through the temple. He not only just cast them out, now we got some more information. He wouldn't let them come back in or anybody like them would come, he wouldn't let them come back in. Now once again, I'll ask you as we keep going, does he continue to yell and throw out everyone, especially those he's trying to instruct? Mark eleven seventeen, and he taught, saying unto them, It is not is it not written, My house shall be called all the nations of the house of prayer, but ye have made it the den of thieves? He starts preaching to the people that were taken back by those bad people. You can always call them like wolves in sheep's clothing in that day, but these people that were going wrong, they were being taken back by him, and Jesus started teaching the truth to the people. And there's a period, not an explanation point. He's talking to them. Remember what it said, a good servant of the Lord is apt to teach? He starts teaching them to correct them. If you're going to call out a wolf in sheep's clothing, you turn it into a Bible study. If it's not going to be a Bible study, then don't say anything at all. Right? Teach. Matthew 7, 29. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Keep your finger there in Mark 11, 17. Okay. But I had to throw in that. Mark 7, 29 says, For he taught them as one having authority, not as a scribe. He's not sitting there like this big teddy bear that, you know, uh, that just fuzzy and everybody just wants to squish him. And he just, all he talks about is love. No, he spoke with authority. Okay. My house shall be called all nations the house of prayer. With authority like I'm speaking to you now. But notice I'm not speaking to you out of anger. And hate. And bitterness. And pride. And envy. I'm not mocking. I'm not name calling. No. Mark 1.22. We read. And they were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them. As one that had authority. And not as the scribes. You see it again. Okay. In Mark eleven seventeen, he says, and he taught. One can speak with authority and still have meekness. One can speak with authority and still be humble. Okay? When you speak with authority, you have courage, you have confidence, you have solid ground to stand on. Remember the right foundation? That's this. You can speak with authority. But some of the brethren are starting to lose it, and they're starting to talk from pride and bitterness and covetousness and envy. And even though they, they try to speak with authority, authority kind of gets lost. It kind of gets hidden by the pride and the bitterness and the covetousness and the envy. Right. Let's go to the last third telling of the same story. Turn to John 2.14. And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the changers of the money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, made a whip, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overthrew the tables, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered what that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Once again, how did Jesus respond to the people that were being taken in by all this? When it came to chasing them out, angry with the cause, he's got that whip, but he's preaching to them, and he's preaching to the people. We learned that in Mark. He preached to them, the people that did the, the wrong, and he preached to the people that were getting drawn in by the wrong. Okay. 
did it with meekness, but with authority. John 2.18, let's keep reading. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Remember how Jesus, he, he sighs with himself, he groans with himself, how long must I be with you? These people keep asking for a sign, but does he lose his temper? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What's he doing? He's teaching them. They don't get it, but we do today. But they don't get it. But then, verse 20, Then said the Jews, Forty-six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Jesus isn't talking about the physical temple of the building. He's talking about his body. Verse 21, But he spoke of the temple of his body. He doesn't yell at them and start calling them names and mocking them and everything. You're so pathetic. Get saved. He's not saying that. What's he doing? He's instructing them with truth. And meekness instructing those that opposed themselves. They didn't get it. But he still didn't change. Because of how they treated him, he didn't turn around and reward evil with evil. He didn't let the lost world change him. He's God manifest in the flesh, but he set the example for us, brothers of Christ. We're not supposed to be letting the lost world change us. Okay? They can attack me. They can name call me. They can make videos against me. They can do whatever they want, but I'm not going to return and I'm not going to turn around and return how they're treating me to, to, back to onto them. Okay, I'm not going to reward evil with evil. I'm going to just keep preaching truth to them. Here's the gospel message. Drive them nuts. Here's Bible verses. Here's some links to some Bible studies on dispensation. You know, eternal security, pre-time James total catch my body of Christ, the true Godhead, true plan of salvation. You link truth to them, and it just drives them nuts. You do not have to go out of your way to purposely start striving with people. Remember we read in there, about a good servant of the Lord is not to strive. Must not strive. Preaching the truth is going to turn them away if they don't want the truth. That's all you got to do is preach the truth. Amen. Mark, turn to Mark chapter 12. We're going to go through one more example with Jesus Christ that I thought was a great example because it shows that when you instruct people in meekness, you're not going to save everybody. But there's that one person out of a thousand, one person out of a million, and in these last days we think one person out of a million, that he's going to get it. Okay, There's somebody there that might get it. But if you're just coming out with just hardcore, you know, pride and ego and everything. You're just going to turn people off and you're not going to reach anybody. But let's see how Jesus did with these people that were sent by the Pharisees to trip Jesus up so they could uh, crucify him. So they can show the people he's fake, he's false. They were trying to purposely see, they were seeking his downfall, Jesus' downfall. They were seeking his destruction. But look how he responded to them. Mark 12, 13. Got to go back to Mark 12, 13. Sorry if this study's a little bit long, but there's a lot of examples I want to talk, more examples I want to put in here, but Mark 12, 13. And they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. They're seeking his downfall. They're seeking his destruction. And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man. For thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. These people were being sarcastic. These people weren't speaking in sincerity and truth. They were being deceptive. Are we supposed to be like that? No. Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? Now know this real quick. But he, knowing their hypocrisy, lost his temper, started yelling at them. How dare you try to deceive me? Starts mocking them. Starts calling them names. I'm going to keep bringing all this stuff up until it's, and get it really in because the body of Christ today has a serious problem with this. But he, knowing their hypocrisy, he knew they were seeking his downfall. Brothers and sisters in Christ, mainly brothers, 
The brother says, Christ, you're going to have the lost world trying to seek your downfall. But brethren in ministry, you're going to have people that come to you with questions trying to seek your downfall. You're going to have them mock you. They're going to have them do anything they can to destroy you. But as long as you stand on the firm foundation and you do things God's way in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, they can't destroy you. But they're going to keep trying. But let's see how Jesus responded. But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt you me? Bring me a penny, that I may see it. And they brought it, and he said unto them, Whose is this image and superinscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered, answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. He, he, he spoke in sincerity and truth, and instructed them that, and, and uh, they, it says here, And they marveled at him. Wow, we didn't know he'd actually give us a real answer. They weren't looking for a truthful in sincerity and truth. They were looking for him to just say, I, I, we don't have to uh, give to Caesar. Oh, now we have a cause against him. That's what they were looking for. They didn't expect him to actually have a good, proper, right, truthful answer. And he spoke in sincerity. He was, he was serious. Verse 18, they come to him the Sadducees which say there is no resurrection, and they ask him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die, and leave his wife behind him, and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife, and raise up seed unto his brother. Now, there were seven brethren, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed. And the second took her, and died, neither left he any seed. And the third likewise, and the seven had her and left no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, remember they don't believe in a resurrection. The Sadducees don't, the Sadducees would say there is no resurrection. They don't believe in a resurrection, but they're asking them. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be for them? For the seven, for the seven had her to wife. They were seeking his destruction, his downfall. How does Jesus respond? 24, and Jesus answering said unto them, ye do, not, ye, do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the scriptures? There's, not, there's nothing wrong with telling these people, brothers, says Christ, you're ignorant of scripture. Neither the power of God. These people don't know the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is God's given me a new life. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Right? I have God in the world. He sanctified my life. God is in me, opening the scriptures. I'm hiding God's word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I have God in the world, and I have hope in the world, that blessed hope. Before I was saved, I was without God and without hope. The lost world will never understand the true power of God, the power of the gospel. That blessed hope is when the resurrection is going to happen. The first part, remember, it's three parts. The first part, I don't want to get off the rabbit trail, but the first part happened at Jesus' resurrection. The second part happens when we, if we're still alive, uh, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive, which remain, shall be caught up with them in the air. And so shall we be with them ever in the air, in the clouds to be with them in the air. Sorry, paraphrase. And that's the second one. And the third one is halfway through the time of Jacob's trouble. There's going to be another, the last part of the resurrection. And that confuses some people. But the power of God... I'm sealed into the power of the gospel. I'm sealed into the day of redemption. They don't know this, the lost world. And when we say, hey, you're very ignorant of Scripture, does he just say, you're ignorant of Scripture, and he walks away? Is that what Jesus does? Oh, you're just, you're just, you're ignorant, you're stupid, you don't know the Scriptures. Why don't you go back to your false, uh, pr uh, false uh, preacher there, the wolf in sheep's clothing you're calling out? Just go back to him, you know. Is that what Jesus, his attitude is? No. What's his attitude? 25, he quotes the scriptures. He didn't just say you're ignorant of scripture. He shows them where they're ignorant of scripture. The Bible says be ready to give them an answer. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but as the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the dead that rise, have you not read in the book of Moses? Scripture. 
How in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am, tell him that I am sent you. I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You therefore do greatly err. He taught them, and meekness instructed those that opposed themselves. Okay. 28. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them, remember, they're all there. They're all there hearing all these questions. There's a purpose to this. Please bear with me, brothers and Christ. We're going to get to it. All these people are there listening to Jesus being hammered by all these questions by these religious leaders and scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees and everything. And one of the scribes came and have, having heard them reasoning together and perceived that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? What is the first commandment of all? Notice he heard them. If Jesus was prideful, as far as, you know, mocking, name-calling, and doing it out of anger and pride and everything, you th think people would want to listen? They probably could keep walking. But Jesus responded in meekness and humble, and he preached the truth to these people. And this guy's like, He's be hey, those are good answers. That's truth. I want some more truth. Verse 29, And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, is here, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. One capital G God. The true Godhead has always been taught, or not always been taught, but the, the Bible always teaches that the Godhead is God and the person singular of Jesus Christ. The Lord our God is one capital L Lord, capital L lowercase o-r-d. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, for there is but one capital L lowercase o-r-d. Jesus Christ. One capital G God, the Father. Okay. Here it says, the, the Lord our God is one Lord, Jesus Christ. The Godhead has always been God and the person of Jesus Christ. Not being. Person. Do a word study on word being. Being and person are not the same thing. Be very careful, brothers of Christ. They're not the same thing. Do word studies. They're really good. Verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Now I know this is Old Testament, but instruction righteousness, I don't like to be called names, brothers of Christ. I don't like people mocking me. I don't like to be called names. I don't like it when people are angry with me. Uh, even with, especially if it's with a cause, when I've screwed up, I don't like it. Um, I understand you can be angry with the cause, but I don't like it, you know. I don't like it when people are bitterness against me. Right? And I can go on and on. So why would I do that towards other people? If I'm angry with the cause, I'll try to correct it and preach truth to that person that I'm angry with the cause, and then give that person to the Lord, and that anger I give to the Lord also. And let the Lord deal with that person. Right? But right here, there is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, capital G God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the, the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now stop there. At first, when you read this, when you're reading all these other people that we just read, they're trying to seek his destruction, and they're mocking him. Okay, and they're trying to seek his destruction. You read this, you think, man, this scribe, is this scribe mocking Jesus? He's got to be mocking Jesus. He's not mocking Jesus. Keep reading. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, in other words, he was kind of fearful of everyone else hearing. He, he's worrying about what other men think, the praise of men. But he answers Jesus discreetly. He said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. I'm talking about the physical kingdom. Jesus came to bring in the physical kingdom, the day of the Lord. And no man after that durst ask him any question. And when Jesus saw that, he answered discreetly. He said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any questions. Jesus was able to reach someone because he was instructing and responding to these people in meekness in sincerity, and in truth. 
You know what? Mocking is not sincerity. I just want to throw that out there. People say, oh, it's okay to mock. Mocking is not sincerity. You're not being sincere. It's not about truth. And because he instructed in meekness and in sincerity and in truth, he was able to reach somebody. They are not far from the kingdom of God. Brother and sister in Christ, you want to reach, be a good servant of the Lord, especially brethren in ministry. You want to be a good servant of the Lord. You need to learn to have patience. Gentle, be gentle. Have meekness. You need to curve that temper. You need to get that pride out of your heart. That bitterness out of your heart. That envy out of your heart. Right? You need to uh, you need to get the bad habit, the addiction of name calling, out of your heart, and, and mocking out of your heart. Right? Uh, backbiting and whispering needs to go bye bye. Right? Now, brothers and Christ, I'm gonna give you a little testimony. I was talking to a, a brother in Christ about the Trinity versus the Godhead. And I was showing him scriptures. And I was trying to explain to him in those scriptures that this is absolute truth. The scriptures teach that the Godhead is God in the person singular of Jesus Christ. Now, what is a person made up of? Three parts. Body, soul, and spirit. Jesus Christ has God the Father in him. There's plenty of verses to prove that. The soul is in him as God the Father. That's why Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. He's the image of the invisible God, the body. And you have the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit that's in Jesus. All three parts make a person, body, soul, and spirit. And the Godhead teaches the, that Jesus is the person of God. And I kept preaching truth to him, and he got really mad. He got angry. He said some bad things to me. You know, you're just lost. You're a heretic and everything. And I can't remember if I just ended it with Link. I usually end it with Link in the Gospel Message. And I can't remember if I did that or not. But I usually do. When it gets that heated and they just don't want the truth, I'm not going to get into an argument. I'm not going to get into a debate. I just link the Gospel Message. For the most part, it's what I do. And I move on. And let God deal with that person. Okay? And a few months later, he came back and apologized. And he now stands firm to the Godhead of the King James Bible. Hmm. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, to God be the glory that that man stands for absolute truth. I'm not taking any glory from God. I'm just doing my best to obey his word when I do instruct people with truth. In meekness. In meekness. If I was a jerk, I hate using that word, but if I was a jerk, I don't know if that person would have listened to me. And if someone else would have had to come along and not only repair the damage I did, even if I was preaching truth, if I'm doing pride and ego and bitterness and I'm just coming across as a jerk, there's just no other way to say it. The next per brother in Christ that, or sister in Christ that comes along, not only do they have to try to preach the truth to them, like I was trying to, they've got to repair the damage I did. Well, not all Christians are like that. You know what I'm saying? They have to repair the damage. Brother says, Christ, you're doing a lot of damage if you're not instructing people in meekness. You're making it uh, adversarial, confrontation, striving. And someone else has to come along. So most of the time, I'm trying to uh, fix the damage that some of the brothers and sisters of Christ are doing out there, some of the brethren in ministry that are doing. Uh, you're making it hard. Okay? Okay. But brother says Christ, I, he wasn't the only one I was preaching truth to, though. I want to throw that out there real quick. I was preaching the true Godhead to a lot of people, making a lot of comments on their King James Video Ministries, uh, some of uh, Brian's old videos on the Godhead versus the Trinity, and some of my videos, when I started coming out with some teachings on the Godhead, I was making comments uh, to a lot of people, and a lot of people were telling me off. A lot of people were rejecting this. So a lot of people were accepting it, but there was a lot of people rejecting this. Only that one person came back to me and apologized. Praise the Lord. All those other people, they never came back. And you're saying, well, what was the point of being meek? 
I had to be meek, instructing those that oppose themselves, speaking in sincerity and truth to everybody. Why? For that one person. That's what matters. That's why we do it. What did Jesus Christ do? He got to reach that one scribe. The one scribe was in sincerity, asking him something seriously. He, he was able to reach somebody. Why most of the people there were seeking his destruction. Okay. When I make comments to people mouthing off, attacking, or asking questions just to ask questions, you know, questions to destroy you, they're, they're trying to slip you up and destroy you, I use the Word of God. I always try to come back with the Word of God. Here's the truth. I try to quote the Word of God. I try to use Bible study videos, whether they're my own or some other brethren in Christ. Good, solid Bible studies. I'll link them to good, solid Bible studies that will help them with their error. And in the end, if I have to, I will link the gospel message and move on. Brethren lately are just responding to them the way they respond to us, fleshly. They called you a name, you're going to call them a name. They mocked you, you're going to mock them. They make fun of you, you're going to make fun of them. They attack you personally, you're going to attack them personally. I've seen it. If you find that you are dealing with lost person, link the gospel message and move on. Don't take it personally, brother, sister, Christ. I know it's hard sometimes, but all the attacks and everything they're doing, Jesus said, if they hated me, they'll hate you. Okay. You're supposed to give God the glory. Remember Paul. Remember Peter. Remember John. They're being whipped. They're being beaten. They're being spit upon. They're being name called. They're being thrown in prison. Their life is being threatened. They're, and they're praising God. Sometimes you brothers and sisters, you forget that when they call you names for His Word, when they call me names because of my Lord and Savior and His perfect written Word, I praise God. I, I praise God. It wasn't easy at first. At first, I wanted to fight back. I wanted to fight fire with fire when I was a young babe in Christ. I wanted to fight fire with fire. You're not supposed to do that. You give God the glory. Sing some hymns. Praise God. Someone that is deceived by a wolf in sheep's clothing, preach the truth to them and move on. Preach the truth to them. If they don't want truth, move on. But how you preach the truth to them is so important. You're supposed to do it in sincerity. You're supposed to do it with meekness. You're supposed to be doing it with humbleness, gentleness. You can speak with authority, because we have, I have the ultimate authority right here. We can speak with authority. But there's a way we correct people. And it seems like the brethren have, have been taken in by the drama that's going on on YouTube lately. Just drama, drama, drama. Backbiting, whispering, mocking, name-calling, making fun of, personal attacks. And you're forgetting that this is our sword right here. The Word of God. His way is the way we're supposed to be doing things, not the world's way. Number 16.1. Turn to number 16.1. I wanted to use this one real quick just to show something. How many of you guys know the story of Moses? <laughs> A lot of you brothers and Christ know the story of Moses. When he brought him out of Egypt, any time hard times came, what did the Jewish people do to Moses? They turned on him. I kind of answered that too quickly. What did they do to Moses when hard times came? They ran out of water, what did they do? They, ran, they were out of food, what did they do? When they start getting high and mighty, thinking, hey, we're equal, we're just as good as he is, if not better, you know, Moses had to deal with a lot. It's just like, there's a lot of times that he's like, Lord, they'd be ready to stone me. What do I do with these, these people? They'd be ready to stone me. Number 16.1. Now Korah, the son of Izar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and Abram, and the son of Elib, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men... And they rose up before Moses and certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly 
famous in the congregation, men of renown. Men of renown. That's why God, just real quick, that's why God says when it comes to an ordained elder, which I'm not an ordained elder, and uh, there's a lot of people online that says, how dare you talk to an elder, and they're a lot, you're not supposed to be talking to an elder like that. They're not ordained elders either. Okay? When you do have ordained elders, they're supposed to be least esteemed among the church. These are men of renown. What are they going to do? And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift, lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord? Why well, think you're better than we are? We're just as equal to you. Now here's Moses. This isn't the first time that the children of Israel are just defying God, uh, being uh, sinful and wicked, worldly. Because Egypt, remember, Egypt's a type of the world. And they're supposed to be coming out of the world, but they keep threatening to go back, go back, go back. When you get saved, brothers of Christ, you're supposed to come out of the world. But a lot of times, your flesh is going to try to get you to go back, go back, go back. But how does Moses respond? I find this very interesting. Did he, does he yell at them? Does he mock them? Does he call them names? Does he ask God to bring fire down and just destroy these people? What is Moses' response? And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. And he spake. He humbled himself before him. Plus there's 250 of them. But, yeah, 250. He fell on his face before him, and he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy. Okay, fine, you guys want... We'll let the Lord decide. Today, what are we supposed to do? We'll let the Lord decide. What does the Word of God say? This is our, how we respond to people. Especially people like this. With the Word of God. With the Lord. With, in, sincerity, in sincerity and truth. Who is holy and will cause him to come near unto him? Okay, the Lord will show who are his and who is holy and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him who he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do. Take your censers, Korah, and all his company, and put fire therein and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. Ye take too much upon you. And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, ye sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel? Remember, the Levites, their inheritance was the Lord. And they're separate. They didn't get a, a land as inheritance. To bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them? And he hath brought thee near to him and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and seek Ye the priesthood also? For which cause both for which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord? They thought they were just gathering, you know, you think they're just gathering against Abraham. Uh, they said it against Moses. Uh, together against Moses and against Aaron. No, no, it's against the Lord. Okay. And what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? And you keep reading, you know, Moses does say, uh, don't respect their offering, you know, and then God punishes them because it's the Old Testament, okay? Uh, he does pour out his wrath on them for what they did. But Moses didn't respond with anger and bitterness and hate. You come to fight me, I'm going to fight you back. And meekness and sincerity and in truth. I just love that. I had to throw it in there. His response was he fell on his face before him. And he spake. He spoke to him. Brother, sister Christ, when you when someone's trying to destroy the word of God and they're trying to prove you wrong, the best way you can respond is humbling yourself and in meekness, preaching truth to them. Speak to them. Don't yell at them. Speak to them. Speak truth to them in sincerity and truth. Okay? Turn to Acts 6 8. Sorry, this study's a little bit longer than normal. I just really wanted to use these examples. Jesus is the number one example in sincerity and truth. 
and meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Be, be gentle unto all men. Stephen preaching truth to the Jews about Jesus. Acts 6.8 Acts 6, verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, remember, I gotta stop for, for a second. If you read this, I don't know if we're gonna, if I didn't go, I hope that went back far enough. But what happened was that Stephen's preaching Jesus to him, and then they bared a false accusation. They're lying about him to the religious leaders. And they haul him before the religious leaders, and they're lying about him to the religious leaders. Now, how does Stephen and respond? These people are lying. They're 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 law. They're false. They're liars. They're deceivers. And start name calling, mocking, anger, let bitterness. How dare they lie about me? How dare they treat me this way? I'm an elder. I'm a bishop. I'm a deacon. I'm the man of God. How does Stephen respond? Acts six eight. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. And then there rose certain of the synagogue, and which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Seleucia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they subjoined men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, This man seetheth not to speak blasphemies, blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth, see he was preaching Jesus to him, that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all sat in the council, looking steadfast on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Notice it wasn't a man that was losing his tail, all red in the face, because I'm getting mad, I'm getting angry, and, and I'm going to... It was the face of an angel. Right. And he goes through, and he starts at Moses, he goes to the Old Testament, and he preaches him Jesus from the Old Testament was leading up to Jesus. Now jump down to 54. Let's see what their response is. Acts 7, 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfast into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and said, and said, Behold, I see heaven open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Okay? There's important, it's a whole other study, that why Jesus is standing. First he's seated at the right hand of God. Now he's standing at the right hand of God. The Jews were given, I'll just say, the Jews were being given, Acts is a transition book, the Jews were being given another chance at the kingdom of heaven, the physical kingdom, the day of the Lord. Jesus is standing up like he's getting ready to come down. Are you going to accept me? What did they do? They rejected him as a whole. Verse 57, Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran up to him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him, with, and stoned him. And the witness laid their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. In the Old Testament, the way it was, is you have to have the witnesses, the ones that bear false witnesses against him, is what is here, but in, in the Old Testament it was based off of the two witnesses before two or three witnesses, let every word be established, they would lay their coats before uh, one of the men that are in charge and, and they're the ones that had to stone, throw the first stone. They threw the first stone and then everybody stoned them. Okay. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus how is Stephen responding to all this? Lord Jesus, receive my spirit and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He fell asleep. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in meekness, in sincerity and truth, instructing those that oppose themselves. Okay, Stephen could have lost his temper, he could have gone off on him, he didn't. Okay. And if you keep reading, Paul, Saul there later gets saved and becomes Paul. 
a seed gets planted. Okay, Jesus being preached to Paul before he became Paul when he was Saul. Jesus is being preached to him, a seed is planted. All right. We're here to plant seeds. We're here to water seeds that have been planted. Right. Now I've told this testimony before. I had a neighbor come down here and get really upset at me. Okay. Um, and he's just yelling at me and to the point where he's not, like his uh, spit is flying because he's yelling so much at me. Almost like he wants a fight, a physical fight. And what do I do? Yell at him back to where I'm spitting on him back and he's getting mad at me and I'm supposed to get mad at him back. What's going to happen? We're going to wind up getting into a fist fight. A fist fight I may or may not win. Are we supposed to be getting in fist fights with people? This is the guy up there that thinks all Christians are Catholics. He hates Jesus Christ. He hates his word. He came down and he got mad at me. And I sat there and I, with calming words, trying to be gentle and meekness, calming him down. I apologized. I'm, I, I wasn't in the wrong, but I apologized to him. I got him calmed down. I got him to go back home. Now, when I've walked, I've said this with that same man, when I've walked, when, uh, he, he starts to talk to me now. He's open to talking to me now. And I'm able to plant more seeds. And I've talked to him. I don't know if I, I don't think I'll ever get anywhere with the man, but I'm not God. Remember, God knows those that are his. I, don't, I can't see the future. I don't know if he'll repent someday and actually believe. I'm just supposed to plant seeds and I'm supposed to water seeds. That's what we're supposed to do. But if, we, if I had gotten so confrontational with him, the guy would never talk to me. I'd never be able, there would never be any doors that open up for me to witness to him and preach truth to him. Brothers, this Christ, 2 Timothy 2, 2, 24 says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God prevents will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. In meekness, instructing those that oppose himself. And we read over there uh, in Corinthians, where it talks about in sincerity and truth. We speak in sincerity and truth. Not mocking, not name-calling. We don't speak in, in bitterness. We don't let bitterness run us. We're supposed to let love, our whole point is love. Remember, true love for the lost world is what? preaching the truth to them. So we speak in sincerity and truth. That's true love for the lost world. Same thing goes for brother and sister in Christ. If you truly love your brother and sister in Christ, you're going to speak to them in sincerity and truth. You know, try to be your, do your best to be gentle and to, in meekness. Okay? Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, how we correct people and lead them to truth is very important. Because like I just said, if you become adversarial... And you become like you're attacking them when they're attacking you. They're attacking truth, actually. They're attacking absolute truth. They're attacking our Lord and Savior. Do you respond by attacking them? No. Right? If you do, you put up a wall. And that person ain't gonna, is more likely not going to listen to you. Right? Make sure you are not motivated by pride. Or ego. Or arrogance. Or bitterness. But remember what true love is, preaching the truth and sincerity and truth. Patience and with authority, with all authority, let no man despise thee. Truth and sincerity. There's a movement going on in the body of Christ online that I've seen online. I don't know how it is in real life, but for like I'm talking outside of online, this is real life, but online world, uh, YouTube, probably other platforms too, where it's this drama fest is going on. People are really getting into the drama fest. They're getting into the backbiting and the whispering. They're getting into the name calling and the, the mocking and the making fun of people and attacking them personally. Okay? If someone's eating fast food and they're overweight, is that why they're lost? No. Is that worth attacking? No. Just stick with the truth. All you do is preach truth to them. They're the ones that will attack me. 
if I was eating fast food. They're the ones that would attack me. Oh, your beard's ugly. Oh, your your head. Oh, you just look like so and so. You're just a a copy. You're just a follower of so and so. And and you know this and that. You're I was called a denlinger, right? You're just a denlinger. They're the ones that do the name calling. We're not to respond in kind. But there's this big thing going on online that uh, the brethren are doing it, and they're getting sucked into it. Okay. When you're calling, if you're a brother in ministry and you're calling out false prophets and wolf in sheep's clothing with name calling, mocking, bitterness, and envy, people aren't going to listen to the truth you're trying to speak. The people that you're trying to reach, you're never going to reach them. Like I used, Brother Brian is a good example in the, in the, old, in the old days when it was King James Video Ministries. He would take with Steve Anderson all the things, the false things he was teaching, attacking the Jews, replacement theology, uh, post-trib, his false teachings on the gospel, his false gospel. He turned them into Bible studies, and he was able to reach a lot of people that were deceived by that man. But today, if you start resorting to the name-calling and the backbiting and the whispering, and you're speaking out of pride, even anger... And what not, you're not going to be able to reach that many people, if any. Apt to teach. Turn it into a Bible study. Okay. Roman, don't have to turn here, but Romans 1.28 reads, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, but God that gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things were not convenient. We're dealing with lost people, brothers and sisters of Christ. Preach the truth to them and move on. Being filled with all unrighteousness, Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy. Remember that word envy. Murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispering. Remember that word. Backbiters. There's the third one. Haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inve invent inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding. Covenant, covenant breakers, without natural affection, impli implicable, unmerciful, without mercy, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only the, the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now I want you to remember these three things, envy, whispering, and backbiting. That's, that's, that, that's what the lost world loves to do. What happens in 2 Corinthians 12, 20? What happens when Paul comes to the Corinthians? They're saying they're carnal Christians. No, you have a lot of fakes, false converts mixed in with truly saved, and the truly saved are getting caught up with the false converts. That's how Satan works. He brings in false converts to try to mess up those who are truly saved. So you have all these false converts coming in that are very wicked, and then they start getting the ones who are saved to start getting into wickedness. Or even uh, having pleasure in them that do them. But 2 Corinthians 12.20 says, For I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be debates, envyings. He's speaking to saved sinners. Envyings, wraths, strifes, backbiting, whispering, swellings, tumults, and least, and lest, let's start right there, tumults. Notice those three things were in both passages, envy, backbiting, and whispering. In other words, the Corinthians, they were acting like the lost world. I fear lest when I come I shall find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as you would not. In other words, Paul's going to come, and Paul's going to look like a foreign person compared to them. Paul's like, I'm a saved sinner, and you guys have forgotten what a saved sinner is supposed to be. You've forgotten who it is that died for you. Why he died for you. You've forgotten who it is you serve and who you belong to. You've forgotten what a Bible-believing, God-fearing, saved sinner, born again, bought with the price, church of God is supposed to be. Paul would look like a foreign man compared to them, and they're look and they're foreign to Paul. Paul looks at them and goes, I don't see brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember we looked at that with Jesus, where he said that anybody who does the will of, of my Father, God, God's will, they are my brothers and my sisters and my mother. 
The definition of a brother and sister in Christ is someone who does the will of God. He comes there and goes, you guys look foreign to me. Where's my brothers and sisters in Christ? Verse 21, but look at Paul's attitude. Unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you. That outraged him. It would out, it'd make me mad too. It, was, it made me mad. But he's saying, my God, I, at least when I come again, my God will humble me among you. And that I shall bewail many which have sinned already, being sorrowful towards them. It's a sad thing. Okay? Lord, humble me. Don't let me get angry. Humble me. So I can reach these people and get them back on the right path. And that I bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. Paul understands that he could lose his temper and cool, but prays for humbleness when it comes to correcting those people in person. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is a humble plea. Yes, we're supposed to correct one another. Yes, we're supposed to stand for the Word of God and fight for the Word of God. Yes, we're supposed to stand for absolute truth. But when you go about correcting, instructing those that oppose themselves, brothers and sisters of Christ, you need to desperately get back to doing things God's way, in sincerity and in truth, and in meekness. You can be angry with the cause, but, when, but you need to have meekness when you instruct those that, uh, instructing those that oppose themselves. Right? Brothers and sisters of Christ, I pray you take this correction, this rebuke, it might have been kind of blunt a little bit here and there. But brothers of Christ, we need to get back to doing things God's way. He's coming back any day soon now. And the house of God, which is the church of the living God, like Paul said, you have some to gold and silver and some to wood and earth. You know, you have some to honor and you have some to dishonor. But it seems today that there's a lot of dishonor going on in the body of Christ more than there is honor. We need to clean things up, brothers and sisters Christ, and we need to get back to doing things God's way. Now, please take this in sincerity and in truth, and I'll end it with this. Okay? May grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Please take this to heart, brothers and sisters Christ. Pray on it. Study it some more. Get back to doing things God's way. I will see you in the next study.